Welcome everybody. The subject today is fractals. Now, this is a subject taught at university and studied and even research going on in the topic now. But there's a lot of school mathematics in your school curriculum that uh, you can be engaged in while learning more about fractals. It's very motivating and we hope you'll enjoy it today. Well, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Tony Bearden. I started AIMSEC about 20 years ago and enriched before that. And my aim has been to help children to learn mathematics painlessly, to really feel that it was an interesting subject and they wanted to learn it. Now, Vinay here, our friend Vinay, is from the Open University. I love his picture with the frog. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? And uh, Vinay is an expert on um, these sorts of things. He's a mathematician and a, and a maths educator. And so we're so happy to have you with us today. My name is Caroline Ainsley. I'm the founder of Bubbly Maths. And my purpose is that every child on earth will love learning and enjoy mathematics. And what better way than help teachers with engaging activities so that everyone enjoys the learning. And what better way of doing that than working with the amazing Tony Bearden. Well, the programme today is all about fractals. And if you teach the older students, then this leads very well, a good, good sort of um, introduction to geometric series and uh, geometric sequences and series. But everybody today will see how you can yourselves and for your learners improve skills, knowledge and understanding of numeric and geometric patterns, of infinite limiting processes, of scale and area, of fractal forms, and examples in nature and human biology. Now this learning spiral is a theme, a sort of idea that runs through all we do, because what we're, we're planning this, or what we're um, running this workshop around is the idea that one idea that, um, is an important idea in mathematics, is best met when you're very young, perhaps even preschool, and then built on a time and again, and again, and again, in probably almost every school year until you leave. And fractals is one of those uh, ideas that um, we find everywhere once, we, once we're alerted to it. And so, early years, lower primary, upper primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, and then beyond, there's more to learn about fractals. So these are a list of the different activities today that we'll be exploring and investigating, starting off with a very simple starter activity, coloring a, uh, a Sapinski triangle, coloring a pattern there, looking at patterns, then we'll come out on to def defining what we actually mean by a fractal, and there's more. I'm not going to read it all out, but that's the program. One thing I wanted to mention that while we are working on activities today, there are two hats that you could be wearing. One, engaging with them as a learner. So you're coming across them, working with them, and thinking about the mathematics in them. And the other is your hat as a teacher, thinking about when your learners will be working with them, then how would you be using this activity? Would you do it differently? What will they be thinking? What sort of questions and support you can provide them? So it can be a bit artificial sometimes, but it's really helpful if you can engage with it both as a learner, putting yourself in the position of your learners or as a teacher thinking about those learners. We're using the do, talk, record principle. It's a solid basis for good, a great lesson. So you do the activity, which is we're going to do today. You're going to do activities today. So the learners do the activities either alone or in, in twos or in groups, depending. Then once they've done the activity and they've got a feel for it, then 
they can talk together, you can ask questions. So we want you to talk to the other teachers, share ideas, and then you record it, you write it down. I know Vinny, you had something to say about this. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, you can see if you, I know it's looking very small, but I'm sitting in an office in the Open University where John Mason used to work for decades. And some of you may know the name or not, but just do look it up. Uh, the Do Talk Record is a framework that he started using over here and we use in our training of teachers because the idea is that doing comes easiest to human beings. We can all do things. Uh, the talking then helps us understand it, not just because of expressing it to other people, but in doing that, we are also expressing it to ourselves. And finally, in terms of the mathematics, the recording is the mark making where we start introducing the notation and formalizing it. So do talk record is a framework we use for the learning, the doing of mathematics, but also when we are working with our students, as Caroline mentioned. So it's very powerful, both for learners themselves and for teachers. So, so thanks. Thank you. And we'd like to look at you to look at the broccoli on the left and the triangle on the right. So we want you to think right now, what do you notice about the broccoli? Just for now, just what do you notice about the broccoli? How could you make it into a mathematical conversation? And then on the right as well, what questions come into your mind if you just look at the multiple pattern of triangles on the right? But you start with a do, don't you? So for the broccoli, you break up the broccoli. And this is how we suggest a good lesson should start. Not with you talking and telling, but with a, an actual activity with a few words from the teacher to get it started as, as possible. So in the, um, in the, here, the broccoli activity, you break up the broccoli and then Caroline says, uh, as Caroline says, you talk about it and you make notes. And for the uh, triangle, well, we're going to do this shortly, but what I suggest here is you could look at the black triangles, count them. Um, what do you notice? You might notice a pattern which will help you to count them um, and describe the pattern and other properties of the shape. So that's just an example, and we're going to do those activities later. Now, here we come to what is a fractal, this question, what is it? And why the broccoli, you must have been thinking. What's mathematical about the broccoli? So Caroline's going to break it as we suggested. Caroline, would you like to do that? So we're having it with cauliflower. So Car Caroline- Yes, we're having cauliflower because I'm gonna eat this afterwards. And don't tell any of your learners, but I prefer cauliflower to broccoli. So we're using cauliflower. So we've got, if you look underneath, you've got lots of little trees. The top, it, does, no, it more, looks more like a cloud. And is a, could cloud be fractal? How's, how are clouds made? But at the bottom, I'm going to break it up. And now it's, it's in two pieces. And they're both very similar to each other. They've got the same structure. And Caroline can break it again. Yeah, go ahead. You lead the words and I'll do the action. So what we you. have got is a shape, a solid, a 3D shape, which we can keep breaking up. And each of the smaller pieces is a copy of the one that we started from. They all look the same. They've all got the same structure. And that's what a, what a fractal is. Uh, the copies get smaller and smaller. So the shape doesn't grow to be unmanageably large. So we'll see different ways of looking at these fractals, this fractal formation. And even now, Caroline's got something really small, but it's still looking very similar. And if we could sort of zoom in onto that, we'd see it was very similar to the original. Okay, Cut it so down to a teeny piece. And yet even that teeny piece, I could break off the florets on top and still make a smaller version. These two images we were talking about where we can start doing things. One was the broccoli and breaking it down to smaller pieces that looked like the original. And this one is the more mathematical activity. Uh, this shape is called a Sierpinski triangle named after a Polish mathematician. And what I would like all of us to do, if you have the printout of the worksheet, so this is 
the very first activity on the first worksheet, uh, we'll be coloring the triangles and I'll just describe which ones to color. So if you can't do the full triangle, at least focus on the top one. And one way to make this task a little bit more accessible for learners is to point that there are two types or two ways you can see the triangles. If you think of a horizontal base, then some of the triangles have the vertex at the top. So the type of triangle that's on the right hand side of the slide. And some of them have, if you think of a horizontal base, have the vertex at the bottom. So we'll only be coloring the ones where the vertex is at the top and the ones that are vertex at the bottom will be left uncolored. So just to make it clear, in the middle of the triangle, there's a biggish triangle that will be left uncolored. And so please have a go at it. You could color them all the same color. You could color them differently. And while you're doing it, just think about how many of these triangles you're coloring. I'll keep quiet and let you do some coloring. I'm coloring. I've chosen purple. That's the most important thing. What color? We're suggesting you use one color throughout for uh, so that, um, well, you'll see later, we, 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 if we were in a group in one place, we could put them all together. And so um, if each of us has chosen our color, we can see it and we we'll see others. Add something that if you don't have the worksheet, you can still draw a triangle. If it's equilateral, that's great, but even if it's not, and then just put the midpoint on each of the three sides and join those to get a smaller triangle. And if you keep doing that, that's exactly how this image was generated. We start with the largest triangle and then we drew the midpoints, joined those to form a triangle. You'll see at that stage, you get four triangles and then you can join their midpoints and so on. And just freehand, I'm not using a ruler, just freehand. So Caroline's good at this, so she hasn't drawn the midpoints first and done it automatically. But if you need well, I've, to... I've joined the midpoints. Sure, you I have. That's what I meant. I you haven't, haven't... I've, I've estimated the midpoints. Yeah. I've drawn lines between the midpoints without actually... Yeah. Since you have this, could you just color some of the upward pointing triangles just so that on the one you have... I'll color room one. Yeah, okay. Not giving Thank anything you. away. No. Nope. <laughs> if you have time, you can color them all. But um, we put the ring around it because we thought if you didn't have time, you could at least do the ones at the top. Well, then the ring might suggest something about the pattern, the whole pattern. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to show you some pretty pictures. Just sit back and enjoy them. This is fractals in nature. We've seen the cauliflower, thought about broccoli. These are the top left one is rivers. From a satellite image of rivers, we've got fractals in uh, lightning trees and of course what goes underneath the trees into the ground clouds i mentioned the clouds with the broccoli it's a similar concept the clouds are made up of smaller and smaller and smaller shape and then the coastlines was a big surprise to me i never thought of coastlines as fractals you've got the coastlines where the coastline is made up of uh, bays or coves and each of those coves is made up of smaller little inlets and each of those is made up of, especially if you look at rock pools or any, any water, any place where you've got water, you've got shapes around the outside, which are fractal. They're made up similar to themselves. So here you see a fern that's been drawn by a computer and a real fern. And it's pretty obvious that the one on the right is the real fern. And it's just a little bit irregular. However, it does have this property that um, at a smaller scale, it's got copies of the original. But the film industry makes use of fractals widely to produce images of all sorts, images of landscapes, images of um, 
as I say, all sorts. I mean, instead of actually producing a um, something which uh, backdrop which they can uh, set, which they can film, it's much cheaper to just make it from fractal images. And bacteria and the veins in a leaf are also fractal. These here are images of more mathematical fractals. So, so far in the previous slides, the images that Tony and Caroline were speaking about were from nature, leaves, trees, rivers. And here, these are generated using complex numbers. We don't have to go into that right now, but this is one reason fractals caught on a lot. They have been known to mathematicians for 100 years, but when these images emerged in the later part of the 20th century, uh, it's working with something called iteration. So you repeat certain commands, very simple commands, and you get rise to these fractals. And they're named after some of the mathematicians who discovered them, uh, Julia and Mandelbrot. And these are more examples of these. Uh, so you can see how each one of them, as you zoom in, it looks the same. And if you zoom in further, it'll look the same at an infinite level. So the other fractals which are real, uh, you can't keep zooming in, but in these mathematical ones, especially when you use a computer, you can keep zooming in and the patterns just keep repeating. Yeah. And it's interesting if you just to notice the, these shapes on these shells look like the triangles that we were making earlier. They're not exactly the same, but nature does reproduce fractal like patterns naturally and more similar ones and it's just even that the spiral on the shells it's it's a larger shell made up of smaller increasingly large shaped spirals it's of course which is the nature of the spiral okay so we're coming back to the sapinski triangle that we looked at earlier and as Vinay says they're formed by repeating the same process or iterating is another word we use in mathematics, repeating the same process over and over again. And we're going to call each stage, we're going to number them so that we see that we get a more complicated shape as we, uh, as we go on to the next stage. So there are, in your imagination, there are two ways you can do this um, and go on and on and on doing it. One is what we were talking about earlier. You can repeat the process of joining the midpoints of the edges of the black triangles and removing the inverted triangle, the one in the middle that's sort of pointing downwards, leaving a white space. Of course, you, we did the reverse of that by coloring. You couldn't really do the removing, but you can imagine it. Um, or you can do this, which is, effectively uh, what happens in a lot of these mathematical processes when you do the zooming in this is what you see you imagine a triangle you reduce it so that the lengths of the edges are halved so if you look from stage zero to stage one there the black triangles are the length edge lengths are a half and then you imagine two more copies and arrange the three triangles with two side by side and one on top. So if you keep doing that, you produce the next stage. So if you take stage one, you reduce it by half, making it smaller, and then you make three of them, to, you put three of them together, you make a stage two, and you can keep repeating that. So we've only shown you up to stage four, but you can imagine it going on beyond that. So, well, you can imagine it, but we're actually going to show you on the next slide, we're going to show you this happening. Now just watch what's happening here. These are stage twos that are being built up. And now we have got another triangle and we can continue.
I hope people can see in this that, so at this stage, the stage five, it's made up of three copies of stage four. And each of those stage fours is made up of three copies of stage three. And then the stage three ones are made up of three copies of stage two. So we can count them in various different ways. We can count them right down to the tiniest triangle, the types that you were coloring, if you wish. And so that's what's come up on the slide right now, which is 27 of the stage two triangles make the stage five triangle. And I think Pam had observed this earlier in the chat that if you think of each stage as taking three copies of the earlier stage, then as you go from one stage to the next, it's three times, but then it's nine times and then 27 times. So, you know, whether it's primary or secondary, students can start seeing these multiplication patterns. And in secondary, they can use the term of powers and so on to understand what's going on. So you'll notice that it says stage seven takes 243 of the stage twos and so on. So as you zoom in, you can see there's greater and greater detail. And this is a way to make a poster in class. It's a way to do the activity and what, depending on the age group. So for very young children, what you do is ideally give them either a stage two, you can see the circle stage two or stage three triangles, and you can give that to very young children, one that's already colored in. And what you then do is you direct them as they build it. So this would be a growing shape, prepare a big space for them to do it on. You could do it on the floor with very young children. As they get a bit older, they can color them in themselves. Again, give them a stage two or a stage three, preferably the same color per section, but children do tend to like to put their name on it and choose their own color, it improves engagement. And then with the older learners, give them more and more of the work to do as they get older. So that's the doing, and you can see the template on the top right there. The complete orange um, triangle, Sapinski triangle is a stage four. So question, how many stage three triangles make a stage four triangle? And then the extension question is, how many stage three triangles make stages five, six, and seven? We, are, we could ask the same question about stage two triangles, which Vinnie was talking about earlier. Now we're looking at stage three triangles. Okay, Melanie says, so that will be the answer to the first question. How many stage three triangles make stage four? The answer that Melanie is given is three. And that is, a, is, is something that young learners can see very easily, especially if they place the pieces themselves and they can see that very clearly. And if we were in one place, we'd actually do this because it's such fun to do it even for grown-ups. So we'd all colour our triangle and bring, in, bring them to the, um, to the board and stick them on and we'd watch it grow. And um, in a class, I, I would get one of the children to actually, <laughs> to, to organise the others in, in sticking them on the poster. And it's a good, a good idea to have a, a guideline drawn at the bottom of your paper because then that helps you to get the bottom actually straight and level because a small <laughs> small error at the, at the bottom tends to get a bigger and bigger grow into a bigger and bigger error as you grow up yeah and this is something you can do as a whole school activity with a huge poster in the in the in the hall or in an area where a, sh a shared area where each class can make a section of it and then it all comes together and makes this really huge shape i just want to say what's really nice is something melanie pointed out that the colored triangles are all the same size. So once you've got those triangles, you can distribute them, as Caroline was saying, in different classes. I used to do it in my different classes and then stick it in my classroom to get this large poster emerging from it. Uh, so. I've also seen it done as, as a people mass thing where you have everybody out on a field 
and people have got a you know a triangle that they hold up and then you take a photograph and show them all it's um that's that takes a bit of organizing but it's it's a lot of fun pam's gone to the higher level she's a, sec a secondary teacher so she's talking about x and x plus one which is three times stage x is needed to make stage x plus one so every every time it's three times more to make the next stage we're giving you the answers here basically so all this is is a sheet to help you to make sure that you've got the answers in your head or on paper to make sure that if anybody comes up with any question you're solid and as you can see uh, we're starting with a stage three stage four is three of those stage five is, is nine stage threes and that you can see a progression you're looking for patterns you're looking for progressions you're looking for sequences these are all really important if it's number sense and it's number sense doing an activity you're gaining number sense doing an activity that is really engaging and it's not only just the state the number of the, each stage you look you can talk about the, the size of it as well and that um tony gives you're talking about a backing sheet of at least 120 centimeters wide and 105 high for stage seven and reckon we got recommendations for sizes but you can get the learners work out what size background you're going to need according to the size of the stages and how big they want to go because they like to go big with this okay so to recap now what questions would you um ask for a lesson here what would what might you do and the fractal is called a sapinski gasket by the way but there's other gaskets which um we may see a picture of later how many triangles are shaded at each stage is a question you could ask and that's what we we've been asking how many stages make the next stage but we haven't yet counted all the triangles from the tiniest one to the biggest one even in stage four you can see there are a lot of them um, and at each stage if you compare the smallest triangle to the whole triangle um, compare them and you also compare the lengths of the edges and you compare the areas there's more questions you can ask um, what fraction of the area of the gasket is shaded at each stage? What fraction is unshaded? And then we talk about making things smaller. So we have a similar shape that's smaller. So what is the scale factor of that transformation? What is the scale factor? from one to the next one for the similarity. Well, we can look at the lengths and how the what scale factor changes the lengths. And we can also look at the areas and what scale factor changes in the areas. And then in answering these questions, what patterns do you notice? So there's a lot of questions for the children to work on and you could have in a, a class you can have different groups in the class working on the different questions and then coming up and reporting to the whole class and sharing what they've found so um, different ways to organize lessons on this and a good way to collect all the information at the end is to fill in a table like this so we suggest you actually now having seen all that and we've talked about it that you we pause and we give you time to fill in the table just think through how you want to fill the table and as we said earlier even if you're doing it the primary children the counting can still be done by them and with the secondary children there's this whole notion of length scaling factors area scaling factors and fractions of the area I just wanted to clarify where it says edge length of shaded triangles. If you think of the stage zero as being a unit length, so that is one unit length, then in stage one, when the triangles get smaller, that's what it's asking for. You know, how much has the length of the side been 
scaled down or reduced by. When you come to the total fraction, you might like to do, change that in, to write it as a fraction and then as a percentage, because it's quite interesting. It's easier to compare the, the, if the percentages than it is to compare the size of the fractions. That's the column for the total fraction of area shaded. Uh, so the total fraction area, Pam says she's getting one for the very first one, which is entirely black. So that makes sense, 100%. And then three quarters and nine sixteenths. So the, the right answers would be really helpful, Pam, if you wanted to also, you could, when we get to discussing it, if you could share your method, I think that'll be quite helpful as to how you got those fractions. So yes, you are right. Talu. She's uh, colors shaded three, nine, twenty seven, Seven. and eighty one. Yeah. Its observation here is that the triangles keep getting smaller. In this case, we're not increasing the size of the outside triangle as we were with the construction. This is a more, this is taking it into your imagination and building a true fractal, which is a shape made out of similar smaller shapes yeah i mean what helps me with this at least and it's related to what tony called it a gasket is that you're cutting out materials so think of it as to go from stage zero to stage one you join the midpoints and you cut out the central triangle and you throw that away so that's a hole and then to stage two you have three black triangles now but you cut out the central white bits and the black is what's left behind so that's one way to think about this process, which isn't about coloring, but about cutting out and everything that's being made white is being removed. And so anything that was white earlier will stay white in the later stages. I hope I'm making sense over there because it's something you've removed. It's not going to come back. So. And to be a true, sorry, is to be a true fractal, it goes on forever and ever, infinitely often. We can only imagine that. So. It would be nice to hear from Akinola because your numbers are exactly one more than what Talu and we have. And not at stage zero, but at stage one. So uh, there yeah. are four triangles, but only how many of them are black at stage one? Recognizing stage zero to stage one was the earlier way we were doing it in terms of copies. And Akinola just mentioned that they were counting the larger triangles, so I can see why they had four oh, and so on. Nice one, Akinola. That's, that's, that is a great additional question. You can ask actually how many triangles are there in all, which is a, a variation of the question. Nice one. Yeah. So coming back to the first column, at some stage we can recognize this multiplication by three going on, and that's because as we saw earlier, stage three is made out of three copies of stage two. So while the size of the triangles are getting smaller, the number is getting increased threefold. So I hope that sort of makes sense. Uh, the second column is a little tricky in the later stages, but early on, if you just look from stage zero to stage one, we join the midpoints of each side to get the white triangle in the middle, which means on the edge, the black triangles are half the length of the original because the midpoint is cutting each side into two halves. So when you go to the next stage, it's slightly more complicated, but the half is being halved again. So in terms of the original large stage zero triangle, there are four black triangles along the edge and each one, its length is one quarter. So I'm not going to try and talk you through the 1 16th, but you should be able to see where that is coming from then. Uh, sorry, the half, the quarter, the one eighth, the one sixteenth, and so on. At each stage, 
you're halving the earlier triangle. And when we've done this activity with primary school children, they all do notice the halving of the sides quite straightforwardly. So it gives them a way of connecting abstract fractions like 1 16th can look quite scary, but in this case, they can point to the triangle and they can see that. In terms of the fraction of the area that is shaded, uh, I think I find what is most helpful is the stage one to see that one shaded triangle is a quarter. I don't need to use any fancy mathematics in terms of area has a square scale factor. Some of you may know that. But over here, you can actually see these four congruent triangles. Three of them are black. One of them is white. So each of those four triangles being congruent is a quarter of the original. And this is really nice to connect the geometry. So words like congruent with the arithmetic. So recognizing that since they're exactly the same, the area of each is one quarter that of the larger one. Uh, one can then use that same reasoning, if you wish, to see why at stage two, it is 1 16th uh, for one black triangle. Because the stage two picture is made up of four triangles the size of the stage one. So one quarter of the scaling is coming from that. And then the one quarter is coming from the stage one itself. That's one way of thinking about it. The other is you can fill up the grid of all the white and black triangles with the smaller triangles, and you can count that there are 16 of them. So once again, there are ways of doing it using some ideas from secondary, which are to do with scaling. And there are also ways of doing it purely by counting. And so that's where the fraction of just one black triangle it's getting smaller and smaller by a factor of four each time you go further. So the lengths are getting halved, but the area is getting quartered. And this ties up this idea that area increases as the square of the length, volume increases as the cube. So the counting allows us to connect some more complicated ideas with this visual representation. I hope I'm making sense, but uh, please do ask any questions. And the last two columns are sort of the most difficult in some sense. Thank you, Talo. Well done. It's the number shaded, that column that's 139, the number that that's shaded times the fraction of each one, or you can multiply it by the scale factor, if you like. So it's actually the, the second column, the number shaded, by the fraction of one of them, which is the fourth column. So if you look at, it's nine times one sixteenth, and then in the, for stage three, it's 27 times an, um, a 64th. And for stage four, it's 81 times a 256th. Uh, because there are 81 triangles and they're each 256th of the area and so on for the next one. And what's interesting to see, which you can see visually, but this gives you an exact percentage here, um, that uh, it's the fraction shaded is 75% for stage one, 56% for stage two, then 42%, 32%, 24%. And as you went on, it, the, the white would spread out because as we really described it earlier, you're, 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 you're hunching out little more, more little pieces at each stage. So, what would the learning objectives be? So by making the Sapinski triangles, making a poster, if you like, having colored them, describing what they see and noticing and talking about the geometrical properties, young learners will develop visualization and language skills. And there's nothing, needs to be nothing more to it than that if you're doing this with seven or eight year olds or even younger. Um, so obviously you don't do as much, but then what we have been doing, you could just now, you could do with older learners, investigating number patterns, the number of triangles and the sequences of patterns, spotting similar triangles, working out scale factors, investigating areas. And at a higher level, we'll see later, you could even sum geometric series to find the total area covered by the fractal. We're just going to move to a different fractal, and there's a task there to consider, which is there are four L-shaped objects over there. They are all the same shape. You can think of them as being made up of three squares. 
And the question is, can you put them together to form the same shape, but a larger version of it? Um, we actually want you to do that. We so, want you to, please, if, if you've yeah. got them, or, if, if, or visualize it if you haven't got them cut or out. Draw or, if or, you, draw, if... or draw it. Thank you, draw it. Yeah, so I was just about to say that. You can just draw them on paper and see if you can put together those four. You're allowed to rotate them, move them, and get a larger L shape out of that. So do have a go. So they're super easy to move around. And of course, it doesn't matter which way, which direction it points in. This is actually quite a nice one to show that it doesn't matter. The orientation doesn't matter. The shape is the same. Can you do that again? Can you now take four of those and make a bigger one? So this is a really nice activity because you can do that at various different scale factors and ask whether it can always be filled in with these L-shaped objects. Uh, so this one, for example, if you think about the original shape, how many would be required for... So earlier, we just sort of doubled the length of the L-shape. This time we've tripled it. So it's not that straightforward as to how it could be done, but it can be done. And there is a pattern over here. Again, if you think of scaling it twice, four times, eight times, and so on, uh, you can get a larger and larger sort of repeating fractal pattern. So it's called reptile, partly from the repeated tiles, if you wish. And there's a big overlap between the mathematics of tilings and these sort of fractal patterns. Uh, so that's just an image showing if we keep doing this at further and further stages, uh, you can get these very intricate tiling patterns. And sometimes you may notice them on some buildings and so on. They're used quite a bit in architecture nowadays. So to see it at a smaller scale, you'd have to zoom in. <laughs> and we've got a video later, which will show you where we actually do zoom in on a fractal. But here we, we could just imagine it going beyond. Just very yeah. briefly, this is a puzzle that, again, you can give to everybody, but if they're stuck a little bit just to visualize a larger one. Because each L shape is made up of three squares, you can once again use the area of a square and the counting of the squares to guide people into recognizing how the shapes fit together. You can also use color. Color is your friend here to help see the patterns. So I like the Sphinx. Um, there are lots of these reptiles. Uh, you might like to um, see the ones we've got on, on our website. Uh, but here's a Sphinx. Um, and it, same thing applies to the Sphinx as the L shape. Now we're coming on to a curve now. Um, and you start with a square here. And that's our stage naught, and it's we're going to make a square flake, not a snowflake, a square flake, by replacing each edge with a zigzag, and that's the zigzag. Okay, so you go along, out, and along, and back, and down, and in, and a lot up and along. So each edge is replaced with a zigzag, and here you'll see it. Um, with the stage naught in red and the stage one curve in black. And that's been drawn by a computer, but it isn't difficult to draw on squared paper. However, it does get a little bit more difficult when you um, go on to the next stage. So this one again has been drawn by computer. There it is. And with the square from stage naught in it, you can see how we've repeated the process of on each of the little tiny edges in the square naught, and there's along each edge, there's um, six smaller edges. And so there's 24 as you go all around. That is stage one. There's these 
little shrunken pieces because when you do the zigzag, each is a quarter the length of the original that it replaces. Uh, when you do that again, uh, you get a very jagged protrusion that goes out and a one that comes in matching it. Okay, and same on all four sides of the original square. And that's the square flake stage two. So we're going, if you can repeat this infinitely often, what happens to the area inside the curve? And how does the perimeter change? So we want you to answer that question. What happens to the area inside the curve as you go on doing this? Think about it. Can you see the process? Easiest one to look at is what happens from stage naught to stage one. It's the area inside the curve we're talking about. And this is a question that a person in a primary school can visualize, especially with stage one, as well as. I think it gets harder as you go on, doesn't it, Caroline? Sure. Stage for one, stage it, one, yeah. it's 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 um somebody like to venture you could actually do it by cutting the pieces around the square and see it's tested <laughs> you'd even cut out the little piece and stick it on the other side <laughs> yeah 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 exactly yes exactly see if it fits this is a very very hands-on activity and it investigates the question of area and perimeter does the area change for different perimeters and vice versa? So Melanie said in the chat, she thinks the area stays the same. So the red square, if we say the red square is one unit on each edge, it's four units long. What about the black zigzag curve? It's eight little pieces on stage one in black, each of which is a quarter of the length. So what's happening to the perimeter? Eight little pieces of which are in that zigzag curve, each of which is a quarter of the original length or the one at the stage before. Pam is saying the area is the same because the bit that's been removed comes back inside the square each time or, or would fit back inside the square each time. And that's a little harder to visualize in the stage two, but it is, if you look at it carefully, you can see the same reasoning that Pam's mentioned. And Melanie says there are four squares taken out of each side. So this would be the stage one and four added into each side. Yes, you get a little bit pushing out and a corresponding bit pushed in. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that the pushing in, pushing out, the area stays the same. So even if you forget the squares, if you just look at the, you know, where it says replace each edge of the zigzag, it's not changing the area on either side because what's pushing in in one direction is being pushed out in the other. So you could try and convince yourself with that, that the area is never going to change. On the other hand, it looks like the length will double because the original square side length would have the four tiny bits, whereas this has got eight tiny bits. See, if you can fit multiple copies of the square flake, together like pieces of a jigsaw to tessellate the plane. So just imagine making a jigsaw. Now here with this jigsaw, they're not different shaped pieces, they're all the same. And you fit the little squares that push out into the hollow that goes in on another one. And we'd like you to, if you've got uh, to think about that, drawn little guidelines. I've drawn the four corners of the original squares, which as you point out, makes it a lot easier to work out where to put the shape. And I'm alternating colors here as you've done on that one. But drawing those four points of the original squares really did help. That was a good idea. So there you see the tessellation. Um, now, <laughs> I wouldn't want to do this, but could you, in theory, if not in practice, do the same thing with the next stage there? 
That's certainly a challenge. <laughs> no, no, in theory, could you do it? <laughs> in principle, yes. In practice, probably not. But um, each of the protrusions, the bit sticking out, exactly matches the bit that sticks in. So you've got, you know, the two matching. Um, and although they've got lots of fingers on them, and it would make it a very difficult jigsaw to actually practically fit together. In theory, it could be done. So Pam, Pam has come up with an answer about the perimeter of the stage one square flake and and the um, and Talu also. Just pointing those out to you. So you're getting an answer there on the chat. OK, so we're going to move on and we're just going to mention this. There's so many things we're doing today. Um, so, Caroline, you perhaps you'd like to talk about this. This is a picture of Caroline, by the way, <laughs> in the picture this there. Is, Tony founded some of some of the people here um, have done courses, they're alumni from it, and it's an organization in South Africa that does hands on courses in face to face and hopefully we're going to be doing those again post COVID. And this is a, a plenary. And this is great for either plenary with the class, a class activity, again, a school activity. And what you do is you start off with a triangle, which is a stage zero. Then you prepare and you can get older learners to prepare the triangles and the younger learners to help stick them. Everyone can help stick them on. So they have to be get progressively smaller these triangles so you prepare all the triangles first one is a stage zero the second one are just protrusions to that and it only goes on three of the edges because all you have is a triangle they are one third of the length every edge length is one third of the original um, triangle and it's good to have a few guidelines to start off with again the older learners can actually measure where are these points a third the way along and two thirds of the way along, get the older learners to to actually create the the, the um, framework, and the older learners also to cut help cut all the pieces out. It's a great measurement and scaling project in of itself. And also, how many are you going to need? How many of each size triangle are you going to need? So we're going to just emphasize here that it's, a, it's similar to this square flake, it's a curve. It's only the outer edge that we're interested in. Of course, we've got triangles, that's what Caroline's been talking about, but it's only the outer edge. So it's a, it's a curve and there's a zigzag that replaces each edge at each stage. You replace uh, the edge by a zigzag and you can ask the same questions, what happens to the area, what ha inside, and what happens to the length of the curve. So here the curve gets bigger and longer and longer, I mean, and the area inside doesn't change very much. It doesn't stay the same like the square flake. The area doesn't stay the same, but it doesn't change very much. And at the end, there are follow-up slides 50 to 56. Now, I'm going to send you a PDF with all these slides on, and we didn't want to spend much time on the Von Koch curve. So I've um, put the slides at the end, which you can look at later if you want to. So where we're coming now after the square flake and the um, Von Koch curves, where you've got a limited area, it's all just the same area, perhaps, and you've got an edge which gets infinitely long, is a fractal form that can also happen in 3D. Now, trees are the lungs of the world because they produce the oxygen. They take in the waste products of our waste product, the, the carbon dioxide, and they produce the oxygen. And both the lungs, which you see the picture there on the left, and the tree is fractal-like in form. And that is optimizing the exchange of gases because you have the maximum surface area here with a given volume. So in the two dimensions, it was the edge length of the curve 
and the area inside. Think, in, think now three dimensions rather than two, and you're thinking of, instead of the length of the curve, we're thinking now of the area of the surface. And instead of the area inside the curve, we're thinking of the, vol the volume contained in our lungs of our, the air that we breathe in or out and of the of the trees too. So that is a demonstration of a really essential functionality there of um, fractal form. Again, the fractals in our in our um, heart and our um, vascular system, the arteries and the lungs are both fractal in form. And again, that's an application in nature of something that we're, we're seeing here. Now, we're moving back to the Sapinski triangle, but now we're moving on to three dimensions. And this was an exciting project that Tony was also involved in to create a huge one out of balloons. But what we're looking at is look at the, the image at the bottom. You've got the same things we had before, only in three dimensions. For this picture, we don't need to look at the reflections, just look at the progression, the sequence, the, the pattern. So instead of 2D, we've got 3D. So what happens each time? We start with one tetrahedron and the next shape has four. And the next shape, which is made up of four of those, has and so on. So we've got, just like with the 2D, we've got stage zero, which is just the one tetrahedron. And then stage one has got four tetrahedra and so on. So we can ask all the same questions at a, at a higher level for um, all the progression now. We have a question here. This shape is made out of four, te uh, three, four tetrahedra. We want to know what the shape is inside. So I want you to look at those images and see if you can visualize the shape inside, in the center. And if you know, please don't answer. I'm just please gonna say it's not a straightforward question, so. It's, yeah, it's not yeah. a straightforward question. And it's a really rich question. It's got wonderful cons um, ramifications with um, area and uh, volume, but please don't write it in, in if you know it. Well, w w the reason Caroline's saying that, it, it, I don't agree with Vinay, it is straightforward, but it's one <laughs> of those things that once you see it, it seems obvious, but until you've actually seen, when, until you've seen it, it is puzzling, I have to agree. Um, and most people, whether they are, um, you know, sort of <laughs> professional mathematicians or not, if they've never seen this before, it takes them a, a little while to work it out. Well, let's put it this way. I've had a 14 year old young person with Down syndrome spot it almost instantly. And I've had people, you know, full adults with PhDs in mathematics and geometry well perhaps not geometry but they they haven't spotted it at all so i think it it's your the way you look at it i've got the um i'm gonna i'm gonna put on the visualizer tony yes why don't you show us caroline and what i have here is a shape i'm just going to whoop, take that out which so you can see it is i move it round it's the same shape but it's it's four it's tetrahedra. Just one, two, three, and four. Whichever way I show it, it's a, a symmetrical shape. So every, every, whichever way I show it, it's the same shape. And I'm going to put this shape, kind of without revealing it too much, in the center. That shape fits completely in the center. So if I now go around, it's got one, two, three, four faces that we can see and another four faces inside that we can't see. 
and the shape that is in the center. Would you like to talk about the volume really super quickly, to, um, Vinay, or Tony, would you prefer that we leave that for another time? We'll leave it, we'll see at the end if we have time. Okay. Yeah. That's it's, but it's just something to think time. about what the volume of this is compared to the volume of the uh, earlier tetrahedra. So it's just that you have a big tetrahedron, what hole do you take out of it to get these four smaller ones by joining the midpoints? It's easy to state it, but yeah, it's, a, it's amazing that well, it yeah. is this perfectly symmetric shape. <laughs> It's a great question for the learners because they they really engage with this question. And I talk about chocolate or you can talk about sweeties. I can imagine, OK, if you've finished, filled each one of these with chocolate or sweeties, how many would it take to fill this? What, how many of these, this, how many of these would it take to fill this shape yes. here? So, Caroline, would you like to show us with balloons? This is not the volume thing. This is just showing the same um, same shapes, but in right. Okay. One of my one of my favorite things. Okay, so here's the same shape with balloons. So you can see the tetrahedron. It's three dimensional. There's the shape inside. We've got the one, two, three for tetrahedra, I'm waving scissors around, not so clever. I'm now going to maybe I should <laughs> stop the microphone at this point. I'm literally removing the tessellations of this shape. I mean, not the tessellations, the stellations of this shape in the center that's made out of eight triangles and, and what, have... what caroline is left with is an octahedron <laughs> sort of a balloon one <laughs> it's the skeleton of an octahedron this is an octahedron this is the skeleton of an octahedron it's the edges well we had the privilege and pleasure of creating the world's largest 3D fractal made from modeling balloons. And we made a huge effort to make that very, very large one. You can see the red one on the left in Cambridge at the Grafton Centre. And that we did not get the record for because, get this, two professors from Cambridge University, mathematics professors, measured it and they weren't qualified to do it. So we didn't get the world record. Well, <laughs> Guinness, even... wanted, Guinness wanted qualified surveyors to measure it. So it, we, it was, it, it was a, Caroline won the um, record with exactly the same structure, but with much smaller balloons. So it wasn't as impressive. I think you which, have to show it with the mouse where which, it is. Which, it's yes, it, it's, a, in the, it's in the, Guinness Book of Records book, and there's the picture. Okay, two point six four meters edge length, which was just a little bit taller than me. So uh, I'm going to show you the film now of um, Caroline assembling one of these tetrahedra. Caroline is really quick at doing these, though I think this is slightly speeded up. Uh, so. <laughs> Caroline, isn't it the balloons allow it to be light so it's, it's more stable or? It, it's light so it, it's not heavy, literally. It's not so much more stable as simply the balloons are strong enough to hold it, but it doesn't hold it another level. It's that's as big as it gets with, because they're meter length balloons at, for that, that structure that goes out so quickly, they're meter length balloons. This, the one in Cambridge, the one that you see there is a lot um, heavier. The um, the they were they were they were 24 centimeter balloons um so there were many more triangles and just like we asked the questions about the the triangle now we're going to ask the same sorts of questions about the tetrahedron how many small uh, that's the stage naught 
pictured there in a sort of purpley color, how many small tetrahedra stage naught and the edge length was 25 centimeters, we used to make the one on the right, which was actually six and a half meters high when it was finished. Um, how many, how many? Um, well, we'll have to work that out step by step. So there's a stage one in, shown in green on the left, and um, that's 50 centimeter edge length, and it's made from four of the stage naught tetrahedra. And uh, in a perfect model, it would, you know, you get these exact measurements. In the balloon model, of course, it's only approximate. And then um, we, we go on uh, and on to each stage. So you get four stage ones to make a stage two and four stage twos to make a stage three. And you double the edge length each time. So it's doubled to a meter and then building it up gradually to make the one you see on, uh, on the picture there. And there are many properties to investigate. And in your class, different groups might ask different questions and investigate different features. Any given stage, the number of tetrahedra increasing by multiples of four, uh, exponential growth in powers of four. Yes, thank you, Talib, that's absolutely right. Now here, we want to actually work out what the height would be in the perfect shape. Um, we need to think of this diagram and we need to know that the vertex of this regular tetrahedron will be over the centroid of the base, which is, if you draw the line that joins the vertex to the midpoint of the opposite edge, at, uh, so right angles dividing it into two um, triangles of 30, 60, 90, and call that length L, um, then the a third of the way along that, or two thirds from the vertex and a third from the, the baseline, that point is uh, directly underneath the vertex. And so you can calculate the, uh, the volume if you want to, but importantly, we want to calculate the height. And so we have got a triangle with H in it as the height, with a third of the length as the other leg of the triangle, make, which is a right angle triangle, and the hypotenuse of that triangle is the length L. So with Pythagoras' theorem, you can calculate the height there. So it's L squared minus a third of L or squared. You can actually demonstrate it very well by drawing by taking a triangle on cardboard and seeing where the balance point is and you practically you can find it out and that's and that's a really nice experiment to do with a class if you do this where you've got the edge length is a meter which is a stage two and you don't need to bother about the a so i suggest that you might Think about the number of tetrahedra. Think about the number of balloons at each stage, and then do this column here where there are 16 tetrahedra at stage two, and if, uh, work the answers out for this column using the formulae that are given you there. And I really appreciate you working out these numbers so I know how many balloons to buy. So I like this is a very practical activity in the sense that people are trying to break the record or think about how it's going to be built up. So a lot of these calculations, you know, whether the ones for the bottom rows, which involve the square roots and the trigonometry to get there, that's kind of motivation for doing that. Also in the top rows, uh, those are counting exercises, uh, but it's still important because as Caroline says, the number of balloons we'll need, how much time it'll take to inflate them, all of that calculation can be done uh, with even sort of higher primary or early secondary pupils. And even how many people you need to do the activity in a given length of time. Time, yeah. No, it's, it's, 
if it was one person, how long would it take? take absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. And would the balloon still be inflated they by the time, by the time you finished? Yeah. <laughs> and Caroline actually has the experience of all of these. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and how? And our next is a stage six that we're going to do, and it's eventually it got kiboshed by COVID. Eventually, we will do it with, by the way, the son of a man that worked, a Polish man that worked with a colleague of Wesław uh, Szypinski's. So there's a very close tie there. That's nice. Yeah. In Norfolk, so it's, so it's Tony hopefully will be able to come. And now, of course, we will be streaming it online when we finally do it. So everybody will be welcome to to come and join and watch and it may be do your own projects in your own locations with different materials maybe you may have noticed that the edge lengths as we are trying to build this bigger one we're not as we said in the fractals you can either be going in to find a detail or you're putting these together like in the balloons uh, the edge lengths are doubling each time but on the other hand as Thalu pointed out the number of tetrahedra are being quadrupled each time and that's what you'll see, what gets you to this column six and the very large numbers over there. I also want to throw one bit in there that while the tetrahedra are just going up four, the volume that is inside this is going up eightfold because every time you double the length, the volume goes as the cube. And so it's actually in terms of the volume contained, it's eightfold there. So if you fill in the answers, in the column for stage two, which is where the edge length of the structure is a meter, then you just have to multiply by two to get the answer for the next stage each time. The edge length will double each time. So you just multiply by two. Um, and similarly, once you've worked out the altitude uh, of the triangle and the vertical height, you don't have to apply the formula again. All you have to do is double it. Double it, yeah. Pam's put good activity to increase lung power. Tell us about the pump, Caroline. So we actually had some balloon decorating industrial equipment, which used very high power pumps that you had two nozzles for every pump, and we had more than one of them. So we had a... a it, it contained a the air line. at high pressure. So yeah, it, it shoots it out really fast and use two tap just the right amount so you don't have to... Every, every single balloon is the same length. The only thing is your fingers, tying knots, yes, that you have to protect your, your skin from being rubbed away. So what we're pattern. doing here, it's a pattern, and what we want you to do is simply, this is put your learner's head on and simply finish filling out all those hexagons. If you don't have a piece of paper, just quickly draw out the pattern. It doesn't have to be hexagonal. You can use triangles. Or you can just write the numbers. So or just write the numbers. You don't need the hexagons, just write the numbers. Yeah, just write now, the numbers in the right so position. Some of you may recognize this, but you're, uh, we're suggesting you give it to your learners and no hints, let them try and figure out what the pattern is and talk to each other and experiment with it. And somebody will discover what the, what the pattern is. I noticed that the left edge seemed to have all ones. So I'd fill it out all the way along the left edge with ones. And I noticed that the one that follows that is a, is a sequence start, a number sequence counting starting with one. So I've got ones along there and then I go one, two, three, four, five and continue to the bottom. And Pam, Pam has said, Pam, yeah. Pam has said um, the symmetry. So it helps to just copy the answer on the other side once you've got it on the left, you can copy it on the right. So that if you look at the, the line that says one, four, 
and then the six is in the middle, and then the right hand side is four one, which is the mirror image. Now, how do we get the six? How do we come? How do we make that? And how do you get the ten? Mm. And then you've got one, three, six, ten. What is the sequence there? What is the pattern? What's the next number? Pam's got something which is different from what I had, but Pam's got you add top two to get the number in the middle just below them. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying is, for example, that you add the four and the six to get the ten. She's saying you add the top two, that is the two above it, uh, each one, to get the one that's in the middle of it below. So if you do that and you add the one and the four, for example, you put a five underneath that and it will start, that will start one, five, 10. And then as Pam said, you've got, um, you've got symmetry there. So it'll go 10, five, one on the right. And then you can carry on the pattern with Pam's method. Um, Melanie says she did the same as Pam. So you see, you don't actually need to know this beforehand in order to spot the pattern. However, it does have a big place in mathematics, this pattern. Um, now, the next thing we want you to do is to shade the cells containing odd numbers. Why don't you just start doing that, Caroline? Just the shells can just shade them quickly, the ones containing odd numbers, and we'd like you to do it too. Mm. Um, and it, it's, um, it may come as a surprise to you uh, what, what um, happens. So Caroline's noticing that there are all ones down the left and right, so she must shade all of those. And she's shading all the odd ones. Don't watch Caroline, try doing it no, yourself. Don't watch, yeah, don't watch me. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to show you. Here it is. Wow. Did you expect that? Caroline has all just started to reveal the same thing. But what, what you actually get is something which looks like the Sapinski triangle. And um, I'd, I'd like, can you take that away for a moment? If they may not mind. If, if you've, I mean, you've seen what Tony revealed, but if you look at what I've got on a spotlighted, what I've got in my visualizer here. This is actually a really nice place to leave it, not leave it, but the next stage for your learners. Because you can ask them, now what? What happens? Without filling in the numbers, what is the pattern that continues? What is the next thing that's going to happen? You've already done some work with the Sapinski triangles. What, what, what pattern are you going to get below? Can you, fill, can you create a grid and, and color it in without the numbers and see what they come up with. Yeah, I also like Caroline's point, which was, if you look back at what Pam and Melanie were saying, that you get each number by adding the ones on top. If you already have two even numbers, then adding two even numbers will, you know, or if you have two odd numbers, then adding two odd numbers will give you. So these very basic properties about numbers can be used without filling in the triangle to explain why they are starting to look like this. So, so on the one hand, it's magical, but there's also this relationship that can be brought out. So Sorry. what we suggest, what what we do, I, mean, I do when I use this with the class is I actually get them to do, once they've done it with the uh, smaller um, grid, they, they, I then give them a, a grid that goes down to starting the bottom line, 120, 190, 140, and so on, 1,140 and so on. And... Um, and they do it as a group then, and it's a lovely activity. Now, what you can link it to for the older learners is when you multiply one plus X by one plus X to get one plus X squared, and then you multiply one plus X squared by one plus X um, <clears throat> to get one plus X cubed and so on. And there's the example of multiplying to get one plus X to the power four you multiply one plus x cubed by one plus x. And the way in which uh, you um, get those coefficients uses the coefficients in the line above. And so we have a 
question for you. Uh, can I just go to something Pam just said? She's said the so top right to bottom left, the first row is all one, second row gives the natural numbers, third row gives triangular numbers, and that's really nice. What happens consecutive rows? I mean, it, keep going. And what, how would you describe the progression as you keep going, moving to the right along those lines to the right? That is, gets quite, the numbers become quite big quite quickly and it's just an interesting conversation what's yeah. happening i mean in if you will go to university level mathematics there are some people who believe that there almost any number pattern that you find there are ways of locating it in the pascal's triangle so th this is a whole field there if somebody wants to explore that uh and it's also we call it pascal's triangle but the chinese also had it and they have their name for it and so it is it crops up in many cultures and many different sequences crop up in it uh, so and this coloring nice... in fact which we've done coloring all the even numbers you could color all multiples of three and you'll see other fractal patterns so it's a very rich minefield it's a great uh, it's a great tool if you investigate all the different things you can do with it for your higher retainers when they're done with the activity keep, keep take them back to the pascal triangle so it is a strong link into the um, into the algebra here for binomial coefficients. Um, those are the numbers one, four, six, four, one in the powers of one plus x to the fourth, and and so it goes on for higher powers. And um, this is another slide here for you if you want to look at it. Slide fifty eight, which will be coming later. So. Uh, we've mentioned Sierpinski's name quite a bit. You know, we had Sierpinski triangles and Sierpinski tetrahedron. And there is a, another whole area of mathematics which boggles the mind, which are called space filling curves. So we say, you know, a curve is one dimensional, it's made up of pieces of lines, uh, whereas a sheet of paper or the blackboard is two dimensional. And we discussed the tetrahedra, which are three dimensional. But actually, what Sierpinski discovered is he came up with the simple sort of rule which is very fractal in nature uh, of drawing a curve. So think of the first picture on the top left. There's a square and at every corner of the square, another square has been placed there. And what you can now do as we were doing earlier is you can scale that image down a little bit and take five copies of it uh, and put it the way is happening in the image below that. So I hope that's sort of clear as to how this fractal is continuing. Uh, one way to think of it is not five, but four copies, and the central square emerges on its own. And then if I go to the top middle diagram, that's basically we've taken one of the second stage ones and scaled it down, again, made four copies of it, put those together in the four corners. And if you fill in the middle square, it's the fifth copy, if you wish, or it's four copies that overlap in forming the fifth one in the middle. And you can keep doing that. So the actual curve is the border of the shape. And you can see how it's getting very complicated. And at each stage, its length is increasing exponentially. What you can prove mathematically, and we're not going to do that, is that that curve, as you keep doing it, goes through every point in the square. Now, this sounds a bit unbelievable. But if you give me any coordinate in the square, I can find a stage where that curve will go through it. So as you go through this, you have to do the whole infinite one. You'll end up filling the whole square. So these are called space filling curves. There are many other copies. If you search the internet, you'll find many examples. And they're an excellent example, again, of fractals. And when we were mentioning the lungs and so on, some people believe that's how our lungs grow. They start out with these simple cells. Each one breaks down into further ones. And we can get this really efficient way of filling something three-dimensional with two-dimensional surface area. Over here, we are filling two-dimensional with a one-dimensional curve. So there are links on these if you want to pursue these ideas further on. So if we move into uh, complex numbers, which we've talked about in some of our previous G10 workshops, um, you don't need to understand complex numbers just to see this equation 
that the f z is a function of z is z squared plus a constant. And if you keep squaring it and adding it the same constant each time, and then you do that again and again, this will give you um, what you see there in the sort of orange and black and so on. It will give you that shape. And the shape on the right is a Julia set, which is related to the one on the left. And these were discovered um, around 1920, um, but they didn't really get recognized by many people until we had computers. And then, wow, all these beautiful pictures became available. And Mandelbrot was the man who popularized this. He wasn't the man who, in, um, who actually discovered this. Uh, in fact, it was published, this Mandelbrot set was published in a paper where um, Fatou and Julia, who, who, who actually published, the, you know, wrote the paper, showed it with lots of little crosses drawn. They, they could only use pen and paper to actually produce the picture that they had in their, in their mind, and they did it with lots of little crosses. However, you're going to see this now in all its beauty. Um, here we go. I guess as we're zooming in, you can see the self-similarity. So technology that is allowing this infinite sort of passage, but there's also infinite detail there. So yeah, it's it's uh... a lot. Uh, it, that's that's just fun at this stage, but there is some serious maths there for it's, a higher level. Very beautiful, mesmerizing fun. <laughs> yes. So this is just this side just summarizes what we have done um, today, uh, what you've done with us, and. Um, Yes, I think if I were to pick out one thing that impresses me most, it's the idea of the, uh, for our trees and lungs, that for us to breathe, we have got these fractal shape uh, lungs. So we can get as much air into our chests and as much oxygen to keep us going. And that this is this is fractal that uh, that you begin to understand if you understand the how the square flake works that curve and how the von Koch curve works you begin to understand how it could work in in, in um, three dimensions. Do you want to pick out to, something, Caroline? I well, I just want to point out what Melanie just said. We've spoken about expanding and creating something by growing it, like the, the von Koch and the and the um, the square flake and the tetrahedra and the Spinsky um, triangle. 
Melanie's talking about putting a piece of moss under a microscope so we can learners in school can investigate natural fractals using microscopes. So mm. that's a nice mm. idea. Mm. Mm. And then just, just to rem a reminder, use these activities to engage your learners. And there's just so much math around it that, that is relevant to what they're actually learning. And it's really engaging. So you've got all these activities that you can use and you've got, which we're going to share in a minute, the links that help you with teacher notes and that um, that give you lots of other ideas as well. Yeah, I guess what I like is the simplicity of it. So, for example, in this, we can see both at the bottom left uh, for the snowflake, whether it's the von Koch one or the square one, you're just replacing a straight segment with something with a little bend in it. And you just the idea that you can keep doing that and get things of you know infinite detail uh, is mind boggling in that sense. Uh, so it's just. So Pamela said the counting quickly got out of hand. <laughs> uh, um, so finding the pattern helps a lot. And then you know how many times bigger or smaller it is each time. And, and you can multiply the numbers. So that's, uh, yes, Pam, that's absolutely right. And that does help uh, children to see the, the value of multiplication. It is just repeated addition, of course. I like Melanie's comment about the looking at these things under a microscope, which is exactly what we were zoom, doing with zooming in on that last a little bit of video I showed you of the Mandelbrot set. We were actually magnifying it, zooming in, as we call it, on, um, on, on software, with software. But, uh, Pan says we need to count it's using the counting we do need to be able to count enough to make sure we're getting the right pattern but at the same and and all of this develops number sense so here we have some links the, the links i was talking about there's lots of links there and they've got teacher resources behind them there's some inclusion guides and in some of them as well which means that you're gonna they're gonna take you from either um challenged learners or early years or home learners all the way to higher level and great lots of incredible ideas to help you in your endeavors as teachers can, can i just chip in very briefly we've been talking a lot about sort of drawing so for example with the font cox snowflake and the the square flake but there's also things you can do with folding paper that work really well and easily so in the middle of there you'll see it says directions for folding the dragon curve fractal uh, that works really well with primary children too, and it's a very tactile doing sort of activity, uh, uh, which just requires folding. So it's not you don't have to worry about sticking things perfectly and so on. So, sorry. Yeah. So there's a, a children's book here called The Number Devil, um, which I didn't know, I haven't seen, and I'd love. I'm now going to go and seek out that Vinay uh, told me about it, and it was it's. Um, it's, uh, well, tell us about it a little bit, eh? Just a little bit. It's a, it's a book by a German poet, actually. It's been translated into many languages. And some mathematicians get a little unhappy about it because this child has nightmares about mathematics. Uh, but what is really nice is this number devil visits the child and over a few chapters converts the child into seeing the beauty and the power of mathematics. Uh, so it's really, I mean, I found it. I used to give it to all my year sort of, 11 to 13 year old pupils who are struggling a little bit. And for some of them, it was a nice window. And what I like about it is the activity we did with the coloring in of the Pascal's triangle, that's there in a very sort of, there are these lights that light up and patterns that show up. So it, it builds in some of that. That's why I mentioned it. And so there's some more links here to our YouTube channel where you'll see uh, recordings of these workshops and other, um, presentations you'll see on Facebook we have a daily starter a little appetite wetter for some more mathematics from the Aiming High website where you'll find, you'll find on the Aiming High website lots of free sources. It's time to say goodbye and we hope you've enjoyed it so it's goodbye from me. Thank you. Thanks thank you so much for joining us Vinny. And, and thank you everybody for your wonderful participation and goodbye from me. This is a Global Teacher Empowerment Network video. 
collaborating with AIMSEC and the Aiming High website. Our mission is to benefit children in disadvantaged communities all over the world by empowering the teachers who teach them mathematics.